Hello and welcome to the second video in this series on John Donne. In this episode, we'll be discussing the theme of love and sex in Donne's work. We'll begin the session with a discussion of Donne's promiscuous early life. Uh, this will lead us nicely into a quick close reading of his poem to his mistress going to bed. Uh, we'll then learn about his marriage to Anne Moore before going on to discuss the pervasive motif of the microcosm in his love poetry. Finally, we'll conclude with an analysis of The Good Morrow. So, let's begin with a little context. Dunn wrote many erotic poems in his youth. In the 1590s, he spent much of his time and money on leisure, such as travel, theatre and women. A contemporary famously described him as a great visitor of ladies. It's in this decade, the 1590s, that he wrote the 55 poems which feature in his songs and sonnets. Um, please note, however, that none of the poems in this collection are songs nor sonnets in the technical sense. Akin to most of Dunn's poetry, these love poems and erotic verses were not published in his lifetime, though they were circulated in manuscript form. Now, one of the poems that I'd really recommend you read is To His Mistress Going to Bed. If you haven't read this poem, I really would pause the video now and have a Google search, find it on the Poetry Foundation, because we're about to have a little bit of a whistle-stop tour through the poem, picking out some key features, and if you haven't read the poem in its entirety, um, this won't be as valuable to you. So really, do go and read the poem in full, and then come back. So, uh, one of the things that you might notice about this poem is Dunn's use of apostrophe. If you're not familiar with this term, to apostrophise someone in a poem is to address them directly. We can see that Dunn is doing this through his use of the pronouns you and your. In fact, the first line, come, madam, come, immediately tells us that the mistress of the title is being addressed in the second person directly. Now, this is a technique that is used by Dunn in much of his love poetry, and it serves to heighten the sense of intimacy between the two lovers. You'll also likely to notice the many imperative verbs in this poem. Uh, these are commanding words such as come, off, unpin, unlace, etc, which are emphatic in themselves, uh, though notice where they're placed. They're all syntactically placed at the beginning of lines, which provides them with additional emphasis. Now, the effect of this is to characterise the speaker as impatient, eager and perhaps a little imperious too. This impression is heightened by the many possessive pronouns which abound throughout the poem. These are words such as my and mine. Indeed, the speaker likens his lover to a mysterious newfound land, which he's in the process of colonising and converting into his kingdom. Now, I won't go into this in too much detail here, because we'll return to it in a later video on critical opinion and critical reception, but it is worth briefly noting that this is potentially problematic for feminist critics, on account of the female lover being objectified and possessed. Returning to the former half of the poem, notice how the frequent use of military vocabulary, words such as foe, fight and breastplate, heighten this impression of command, colonisation and control. This is juxtaposed, however, by the sense of sanctity and sacredness, which is captured by allusions to precious items, such as um, coronets, temples, and in the latter half of the poem, precious stones, gems, and mystic books. Finally, Dunn's characteristic wit is captured by puns throughout the poem, such as, until I labour, I in labour lie. Now, these are only a few ideas. I urge you to return to the poem after this video and jot down your own initial thoughts and annotations. This promiscuous chapter in Dunn's life was put to an end when he met his wife, Anne Moore. Anne was the niece of Dunn's employer at the time, a man named Sir Thomas Egerton, for whom Dunn was working as his private secretary. Dunn and Anne married in 1601, when Anne was 16 years old. However, both Egerton and Anne's father, a man named George Moore, fiercely disapproved of the match. George Moore refused to provide the couple with a dowry as a result, and Egerton actually had Dunn imprisoned for a short time. This meant that the first eight years of their married life was filled with financial hardship. It was only after these eight years that George Moore finally provided a dowry. 
Dunn famously wrote these words in relation to their situation. John Dunn, and Dunn, undone. Now, bearing this context in mind, let's return to Dunn's love poetry. Dunn frequently uses the image of a microcosm to describe the love shared by two lovers. A microcosm is a small world. It's a small part of a whole which is seen to be representative of that whole. In other words, it's a miniature representation of a bigger picture. You might say, for example, that a small habitat in a rainforest is a microcosm of the rainforest as a whole. In this example, the habitat is known as the microcosm and the rainforest is known as the macrocosm. The habitat is only a small part of the rainforest, but it's seen to be representative of the whole thing. To use another example, you might describe a small village as a microcosm of the country of which it is a small part. This means that the village captures somehow the spirit or the look of the country as a whole. Now, in the 17th century, philosophers, mathematicians and artists were very interested in microcosms and macrocosms. It was one of the main ways in which intellectuals in all these different fields sought to understand and interpret the universe in the larger world. In particular, it was often thought that the human, the human body, mind and soul, was a microcosm of the universe, a miniature representation or imitation of the larger world. If you're familiar with Shakespeare's King Lear, you'll know that the storm on the blasted heath mirrors the chaos in Lear's soul. And this was certainly influenced by philosophical ideas about man as a microcosm of the universe. In Dunn's poetry, the love shared by two lovers is often presented as a microcosm. It's like a little world in itself, divided from the rest of society. So, Dunn's poem The Good Morrow is really useful for illustrating this idea. It's a poem that's made up of three septets, that's three stanzas of seven lines. And the first stanza introduces the idea that the lives that two lovers led before they met each other were essentially meaningless. You'll see that he begins with the rhetorical question, I wonder by my troth what thou and I did till we loved, which immediately sets up this idea. He goes on to use words that we associate with childhood, such as weaned and childishly, which serves to suggest that the lives that the two lovers led before they met lacked the mature perception that we associate with adulthood. Dunn then reinforces this idea with an allusion to the Seven Sleepers' Den. Now, there are several versions of this story, but the one that Dunn would have been familiar with is that which belongs to Christian legend, which is the story of seven persecuted Christians who flee their persecutors by retreating to a cave. They're left in this cave to starve and die, but they miraculously fall asleep instead of doing so. The purpose of this illusion is to suggest that the lives that the two lovers led before they met each other was essentially a form of slumber. It lacked any form of activity, energy or vitality. Now, for the purposes of this discussion of microcosms, we're going to focus in on the latter two stanzas. So you'll see that Dunn claims that the love that the two lovers share makes one little room in everywhere. The space that the two lovers occupy, in other words, becomes a little exclusive world of its own. It is a microcosm. Dunn adds further emphasis to the perfection of the microcosm by making the outside world appear anarchic and hazardous, an idea which is captured by the image of sea discoverers making perilous journeys in the hope of discovering new worlds. He dismisses the outside world and, in doing so, emphasises the sense of separation between the lover's microcosm and outer, external society. At the end of this stanza, Dunn writes... Let us possess one world, each hath one and is one. By this, Dunn means that the lover that he is addressing is everything to him. Therefore, she's a kind of world. Similarly, he's everything to her, and therefore he's a kind of world to her. Therefore, both lovers are worlds for each other and have worlds in each other. Dunn emphasises the sense of separation between the microcosm of the lovers and the outside world by suggesting that the microcosm is not subject to the forces of time which govern the outside world. He writes that their world has no sharp north and no declining west. Indeed, he goes so far to suggest that as the microcosm isn't subject to time, it can't be subject to death either, 
Within it, none do slacken, and none can die. Finally, Dunn emphasises the sense of a metaphysical connection between the lovers by blurring the distinction between their separate entities. He writes that my face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. This serves to blur the distinction between their bodies, blur the boundaries between them, which is reinforced by the rhyme here, thine and mine, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, serves to reinforce the sense of a metaphysical connection between them, a connection which transcends flesh and physical parameters. Now, if you're looking for poems to compare this poem to in an essay, I'd recommend The Sun Rising. This is a poem in which Dunn and his lover berate the sun for rising and disrupting their little world and forcing them out into the outside world. So it too reflects on the theme of the microcosm. Similarly, the canonization is a poem which mocks society for being critical of two lovers and presents the outside world as similarly chaotic as the good morrow. However, it should be noted that it, the canonization concludes with Dunn claiming that the love of the two lovers serves as a model example for the rest of the world, and therefore, unlike the good morrow, there is a kind of reconnection with the outside world at the end of the poem. Finally, the poems A Valediction Forbidding Morning and The Ecstasy both present a similar metaphysical connection between two lovers. That's a connection which, as I said, transcends the flesh, um, transcends physical boundaries. Now, if you're writing an essay on the motif of the microcosm, or you're talking about Dunn's rejection of the outside world and the sense of exclusivity which he cultivates in these poems, I really would recommend deepening your discussion by referring to his marriage to Anne and the disapproval that they faced from her relations. It may well have been this context which inspired Dunn to imagine a world in which one truly can distance themselves from society and form a little exclusive microcosm with the people that they love. So referring to that biographical detail will always help enrich your discussion. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you've got a request for another one, please do comment down below. Uh, you can also find our textbooks online, you can follow us on social media, you can like and subscribe, whatever you want to do, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again.